up is in the name of the Lord. Come on and rise up, you people of power. Come on and stand up across the land. Come on and take up the sword of the Spirit. Come on and pull down the enemy. Sing it out. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Sing it out. The snare is broken. The snare is broken, and we are escaped out of the snare of the Father. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Help is in the name of the Lord. Come on and rise up, you people of power. Come on and stand up across the land. Come on and take up the sword of the Spirit. Come on and pull down. The enemy, sing it out, I will lift my hands, I will lift my hands to sing your praises, I'm going to put a trumpet to my mouth, you are my high tower, the rock of my salvation, you are my healer and my God, you are my healer and my God. Oh, my Lord, you are the strength of my salvation. Tell me whom, whom shall. Sing it out when troubles come. When troubles come, I know you'll hide me. Standing in the shadow of the Almighty. Standing in the shadow. We're going to sing that chorus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Let's stand to our feet this morning, can't stop praising, can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name, can't stop praising the name of Jesus and I just can't stop can't stop praising his name I just can't stop praising his name praising the name let's sing it while I sign every knee and every knee shall bow every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord forever yes every knee shall bow every knee shall bow Every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, can't stop praising, can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name, can't stop praising the name of Jesus. And I just can't stop, can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name, can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Amen. How many are grateful for the risen King? Amen. Jesus Christ is Lord this morning. Amen. Forevermore. We're going to sing that chorus. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Amen. Let's worship Lord. Amen. This morning. And breathe on me. Breathe on me. Lord, let your spirit breathe on me. Yesterday's gone. Today I'm in need. Lord, let your spirit sing it out. Rain on me. Rain on me, rain on me, Lord, let your spirit rain on me. Yesterday's gone, today I'm in need. See that verse, burn in me, and burn in me, burn in me, Lord, let your spirit burn in me. Yesterday's gone, today I'm in need. Sing all that sign, breathe on me. Yes, breathe on me, breathe on me. Lord, let your spirit breathe on me. 
Yesterday's gone. Today I'm in need. Oh yes, rain on me. Rain on me. Rain on me. Lord, let your spirit rain on me. Yesterday's gone. Today I'm in need. Oh, sing it out. Burn in me. Burn in me. Burn in me. Lord, let your spirit burn in me. Yesterday's gone. Oh, yes, we bless you, Lord. Sing it out. I've been forgiven. Well, I've been forgiven. I've been set free. Restored and saved. Oh, sing it out. I am free. And I am free. The stone's been rolled away. I've been delivered, been released. Well, I've been delivered. I've been released. Been washed and purified. My God has set me free and I'm released. The stone's been rolled away. I've been released. The stone's been rolled away. Now come on, everybody singing. Glory, glory. We're singing. Glory. We're singing glory. Oh, restored and sanctified. Restored and sanctified. The stones been rolled. Singing from the top, I've been forgiven. Well, I've been forgiven. I've been set free. Restored and sanctified. In Christ, I've been released and I am free. The stones been rolled away. Oh, thank God we're free. And I am free. The stone's been rolled away. I've been delivered, been released. Well, I've been delivered, I've been released. Been washed and purified, my God has set me free. I've been released. The stone's been rolled away. I've been released. The stone's been rolled away. Oh, singing glory. Come on, everybody singing. Glory, glory. We're singing glory. We're singing glory. Restored. Restored and sanctified. The stone's been rolled away. Oh, give the Lord praise this morning, church. Worship him. Lord, we magnify. Amen. Thank God for that stone that's been rolled away. Amen. Jesus is alive this morning. We're going to slow it down. Join with us. Amen. As we lift our hands, sing that chorus, I fix my eyes on Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. I lift up my head. I sing out a song. If you are weary And if there's no light In the darkness you Oh yes, there is light There is light Look at the Savior and you'll find a life more abundant and free. I lift up my hand, I sing out a song, I'll fix my Of this earth, all 
all pass away, oh, fix my eyes. Oh, sing that verse, take heart, his goodness, take heart, his goodness and mercy overshadow my deepest in oh yes through death through death to life everlasting and Jesus leads on and we follow him oh sing it again Jesus leads on on and we follow him there I lift up my head I sing out a song I'll fix my eyes on Jesus till the things of this earth pass away I'll fix my eyes oh, oh sing it with this I will shine in light I will shine in light behold this glory come face to face with the Lord of hosts I will join the song of thousands and thousands Holy, holy, I will shine in light. Behold this glory, come face to face with the Lord of hosts. I will join the song of thousands and thousands. Holy, holy, and holy. sing out a song I'll fix my eyes on Jesus till the things of this earth all pass away I'll fix my eyes oh let's sing it one last time I will shine in light. I will shine in light. Behold His glory come face to face with the Lord of hosts. I will join the song of thousands and thousands. Holy, holy, I will shine in light. Behold His glory come face to face with the Lord of hosts, I will join the song of thousands and thousands, holy, holy and holy. of my head, I sing out a song, I'll fix my eyes on Jesus, to the things of this earth, I'll pass away.
what a wonderful time it is to be in the house of God on Easter, amen. Jesus Christ is alive and well, risen from the dead, amen. And we believe that here this morning, amen. Uh, with that being said, we're going to get uh, going into a time of prayer, as we always do, going in each and every service, amen. We're going to be asking God to, uh, first and foremost, minister to us here this morning on Easter Sunday, amen, as we uh, look back and I'm thankful for what God has done in each and every one of us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Amen. And we're so thankful for that and all that has happened. Amen. We want to be praying uh, that God would uh, minister to us here this morning. Amen. We want to be asking God to uh, touch Pastor Zebul here this morning, give him the mind of Christ, uh, and, and uh, just touch us supernaturally through this message here this morning as well. We want to be praying uh, for our, our fellowship around the world, praying for God's hand upon our fellowship, praying for our mother church in Prescott, Pastor Mitchell and his wife, Lisa, always lifting up our headship as well, lifting up Pastor Zebul and his wife, Annette, here in the Yuma congregation, that God would continue to touch each and every one of us, each and every family represented here this morning, and as well, I want to be praying for our churches that we have out overseas, the Bravos in Loja, Ecuador, for Naaman and Don Shuk in Kimberley, South Africa, as well for the uh, the new works that are uh, being uh, sent out out of Kimberley as well, always lifting them up, uh, lifting them up, and our baby works, Amen. And we also want to be praying for uh, our our nation that we reside in, praying for the United States, praying for our president, his cabinet underneath him, Amen. Uh, we also want to be praying just for the future of our nation, Amen. This is an election year, Amen. A lot of important decisions are always being decided. We want to be praying that uh, that God is in control, Amen, and we know that He is in control. And that we can uh, trust in him in that as well. Amen. We have a number of needs here uh, this morning. want to be praying for uh, Raul Bustillos here this morning and Richard Arniano, especially, amen, that God would lift them up in prayer. Uh, we can lift them up and asking God to move in their needs as well. want to be praying for a uh, number of needs of uh, salvation. Selena Reyes for salvation. want to be praying for uh, Antonio Jr. Amen. For salvation as well. For uh, Laura Carnahan for healing this morning. Uh, as well for the Rodriguez family for salvation and healing, Nasia Lopez for salvation, Xavier Topete for salvation, Terry Abbey for salvation as well. And uh, we want to be also praying for uh, Sister Jennifer. Uh, she was uh, been in a, in a car accident, and we want to be praying for God's hand of uh, protection over her life, a uh, speedy recovery if any injuries has happened. Amen. We want to be praying for them as well. How many of you here have a need upon your own heart? We'd like to signify that here this morning. Amen. Let's ask God to minister uh, to uh, to our hearts here this morning once again and pray for every need, spoken and unspoken. Amen. I can have my brother Edgar Rosso open us in prayer here this morning in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing, all that you're going to do, Father God. We establish, Father God, your presence, Father God, your dominion, your authority in this place. We bring every need, Father God, spoken and unspoken. We bring it into captivity, Father God. We pray, Father God, that you would minister to our hearts, Father God. Have your way, Father God. Have your way. person next to you, the family in front of you, behind you, welcome each other out to the Potter's house here this morning.
Well, praise the Lord. Happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone here. We're glad you're with us today. We do want to welcome you to the Potter's House Church. We're grateful that you've come to be a part of the service this morning. Very, very special day. If you're familiar with Christianity at all, everybody would say Christmas and Easter, the most important days. But I will tell you, today is the most important day. And all of Christianity, of course, if Jesus wouldn't have been born, we wouldn't be here but if he wouldn't have died and risen again, we would not have any reason to be here today. So we're glad you're here with us. and We want to welcome you if you're a first-time visitor with us. We're glad that you're with us in this service this morning. I believe God's going to help us. We're going to have a great time right at the end of the service. We are going to be sharing together in a time of communion. And we invite you to stick around for that right at the end of the service this morning and then we also want to make a couple of announcements this evening in our evening service many people know but if not if you are here and you've recently or over the last year given your life to jesus christ and you have not been yet baptized in water we're going to be having a water baptism tonight for anyone who needs to uh, be baptized and bury the old life and bring up the new one of the profound issues of christianity everybody thinks that you know the cross is the symbol of christianity believe it or not it wasn't the cross it's actually the fish and that's a whole story i don't have time to tell you but reality is the significance of baptism was back in jesus day to jesus you turn from your sins and then you bury the old life and but you're still a sinner unless you've been born again and so we invite you to come and be a part of that this morning and especially if you've never given your life to jesus this service this morning would be a great opportunity for you to do that but that's our service tonight 6 30 p.m we pray at 5 30 and then looking ahead to the week coming just a couple of quick announcements uh, we do have prayer in the morning every morning at seven o'clock for those in the area on the way to or from work or going home and tomorrow evening we have a regular monday night prayer time here from 6 until 8 p.m. I do have to apologize to our youth and our youth Bible study. We're going to have to cancel that tomorrow evening. And so if you were planning on that, we will announce the next time. Uh, but we have to cancel that tomorrow evening. My wife's going to have to be out of town tomorrow. So I want to encourage you. We will continue that again. But as well, we will be starting our home Bible studies Take note of that. We'll be starting our home Bible studies one week from this Tuesday. And so take note of that. That's April the 9th. We'll be starting those at various homes around the city and invite you to plan. We'll have a poster up and all the addresses and get you involved and encourage you to get involved in one of those one week from this Tuesday. But tomorrow night, the youth study is having to be canceled. We will be back here Wednesday for our midweek service. Looking forward to that. And then into the weekend, we do want to remind you uh, for April we have another soldier home we are celebrating our 50 year anniversary and doing that we have a number of older pastors that have gone back a lot of years they've been out and we're trying to get these men back with us and so this coming Sunday morning we are having Pastor Gilbert Zesueta going to come in and minister for us amen he's in Murrieta California now ministering there but we're going to welcome Pastor Gilbert and Yoli back in with us this coming Sunday. And look forward to another soldier home. So take note, put that in your calendar. Going to be a great blessing and looking forward to all that God is going to do. That's all of our announcements. We want to encourage you. Amen. There is on the back table or back wall a youth rally in Prescott this weekend. The information is on the back wall it's a special thing they do every year we've gone up to be a part of this we need a sign up sheet today we have vans reserved and we need some drivers if you're able to do that this coming saturday and the the guest speaker this year is pastor jesse cluck from the island of guam many of you would know pastor glenn cluck from very many services here with us but his son's now taken over since he passed away pastor jesse will be ministering in that big outreach and then there's a great event they're having the information's on the back wall so if you'd like to be a part of that this coming saturday take note we obviously have to get out of here pretty early to get there by nine o'clock in the morning but we'll do everything we can to not only get you there but to allow you to be a part of that so put that in your calendar if you'd like to go you're a young person anywhere up till about 25 26 there's a van sign up sheet back there and we need you to get on there today 
will be leaving out of here. This is everybody's favorite part at 4 o'clock on Saturday morning. You're young, amen. I used to do it all night long and get up to go to work at 4 in the morning, amen. Don't go there, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But you're young and still got it with you. Amen. Four o'clock. The reason being that leaves us a stop on the way and be able to be there by nine o'clock when they start their ministry and looking forward to that. So we make that available to all of our young people. Apologies for not having that sooner. I was out of the country. And so that's, this is a little late notification, but the information and sign up sheets on the back wall. So take advantage of that. Let's give the Lord a clap offering as we ask our ushers to come on this Sunday morning. Father, we thank you. God, we welcome your touch and your throne. God, we call out to the heavens right now. We want to receive this morning's offering today on this Resurrection Sunday. You know, one of the astounding things the Apostle Paul said, and this is kind of hard to really process, but he said, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. I've seen people in churches over many years of pastoring it's almost like if you squeeze them enough, they'll give you a drop or two like a bitter lemon. Amen. But I'm telling you, when somebody knows Jesus, when they get saved, when they get right with God, something profound takes place. We understand how much God's given for us. And then we have an opportunity to give back to him. We have a lot going on this coming month, with April coming, our missionaries and their care. Join us together this morning as we give. Let's honor God as we bow our heads. We're going to ask God to bless time of gift and giving. Rob Weeks, would you pray and ask God's blessing? Amen. As we give, let's sing that chorus, Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate, celebrate Jesus, celebrate Jesus, celebrate Jesus, celebrate Jesus, celebrate, celebrate, he has risen, and he has risen, he has risen, and he lives. Forevermore, He has risen. He has risen. Come on, celebrate the resurrection. Oh, sing it again. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Oh, celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus, celebrate, celebrate. He has risen, and he has risen, he has risen, and he lives forevermore. He has risen, he has risen, come on, celebrate. The resurrection. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, singers and musicians. Yes, amen. <laughs> Greatly appreciate all of the ministry. Appreciate all of you today. Glad you're with us on this resurrection Sunday morning. We are thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to go with me on this Sunday morning into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter number 27, for those of you who are not familiar with your Bible and you don't understand the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, I'm going to try and fill in some of the blanks for you today and give you a little bit of understanding. And I think if you were here in our Sunday school, we showed a short video in Sunday school this morning instead of our uh, study that we're in from here to eternity. And I did that because I wanted to help everybody understand the power of the scripture we're going to read this morning. If, if you weren't here for Sunday school, you can get with our, our tech team in the back and they'll be glad to give you the link to that video. It's an eye-opener, especially for Easter Sunday. But having said that, as we go into Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, 
Here's two things that are profound to all of us and should be a great comfort to every man and woman sitting here right now. I want you to hear what Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. That is profound. Another scripture says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do we have any sinners here? You don't need to raise your hand. Amen. We all know that because we all should raise our hand. But the best part of it all is the capstone of everything Jesus did in John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. One of the amazing things about Jesus Christ, and you have to wrap your mind around this, he never did harm to anyone. Now just ponder that for a minute. I said the other evening, I believe Wednesday night, in a message, Judas betrayed him. He didn't destroy him. Peter denied him. He did not slap him down. The religious people caused him to be crucified. They beat him. The Roman soldiers destroyed his life and took away everything he had. And not one time did Jesus say, to hell with you. Not one time did he say, be blind, be dead, fall over. You'll never live again. Not one time did he lash out. That's good news for every sinner in this building because you're still alive. It's proof that God still loves you. Amen. And everybody should have said, thank you, Jesus. But I want you to ponder this because here's an interesting thing. While Jesus' life was filled with loving people, healing people, restoring people, with miracles upon miracles, the word of God says if all the things Jesus did were recorded in books, you would not have enough books to record them all. While all of that was what Jesus did while he was here, it would have been nothing if, number one, he would not have died for our sins because he's the only one that could pay for our sins. And even greater than that, number two, it would have been nothing if he wouldn't have risen from the dead. I want you to hang on to those words. Jesus dying was the only sacrifice that could have paid for your sins and mine. Otherwise, we were hopeless. We need Jesus today. If you somehow don't believe that, please change your opinion this morning. You need Jesus as much as I did and they did and he did and you do. We need Jesus today because we cannot take care of our own sins. But let's talk about the second part is if he didn't rise again, then everything he said and everything he preached and all the love of God and him dying for us, if he did not rise again, that was the proof positive that Jesus was who he said he was, the son of God, that he would die for the sins of men and women and he would resurrect on the third day because of the significance of his death, Jesus prepared his disciples. And so I just want to give you this issue so we understand where we're going this morning. Three times specifically, Jesus told his disciples and his followers he would rise again. Matthew 16, verse 21, the Bible says from that time on, this is at the place where Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, but my father in heaven. And then he goes on to say in chapter Matthew 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priest and the scribes and be killed on the third day and be raised. At that moment, if you know your Bible, the Bible says Peter rebuked him, saying, not so, Lord, that's not going to happen with you. And Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me for you're setting your mind on things of this earth and not on the things of God. Peter got a revelation that day. He just confessed Jesus as Savior, 
But then when Jesus said, I've got to go die and rise again, he said, that's not going to happen. The second time Jesus predicted his death was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and it would take too long to explain all of that to you. But the Bible says he comes down off the mountain. He comes across a man whose boy is demon-possessed. The disciples were unable to cast out the demon, and Jesus speaks to them, and he casts out the demon, and then as he's talking to his men, the Bible says they went from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and when he is killed, after three days he will rise, but they did not understand this saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And Matthew's version says they were greatly distressed at that. And finally, Jesus told his disciples one more time what was going to happen to him as they approached Jerusalem. Here's where we pick up most often the Easter story. Listen to the words in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised again on the third day. Jesus spoke about his death and resurrection numerous other places, but not as clear as that. And so I want to minister this morning on proof beyond a doubt that what Jesus said he was going to do, he not only died on the cross for our sins, but that he rose again. So if you're new to the Bible or if you're not very familiar with the Bible, then firstly, we have to ask an interesting question. This would do every one of us good to ponder this for our own selves this morning. Why in the world was there such a hatred and desire to destroy Jesus Christ, not from sinners, but from religious people and religious leaders. If all he did was good, the word of God says, and he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. If that's what Jesus' ministry was, why was the desire so great to kill him, to get rid of him? Why was the desire so great? I don't even want to bring this up, but 2,024 years later, if you've been reading the news yesterday or today, you realize our current presidential administration declared today, Resurrection Sunday, the National Day of Transgender Visibility. Not Easter, not Resurrection Sunday, the National Day today on Easter of Transgender Visibility. You're going to have to put your mind around that because if this day is not to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, they could have done that on 420 Marijuana Day. They could have done that on any other day. Why did they choose to call that this day today? Back then, as of today, there are people that absolutely hate and despise Jesus Christ. And I'll give you just a quick glimpse of why that is so. The Jews expected that their Messiah was going to come, and he was going to come as a conqueror and free them from the Roman rule and reign over their lives. The Jews were a despised people. The Romans were in charge. The Greeks assisted them. They were the wealthy. They were the upper class. They were the elite. And the Jews were the lower class along with just your everyday ordinary sinners. Very amazing to think about this for a moment because the Jewish people knew a Messiah was going to come. But they expected him to come riding on the back of a horse with swords drawn and great armies to defeat all of Rome and send them fleeing. But Jesus comes as a baby. And he comes as this meek and mild-mannered, loving individual that says, forgive your enemies, don't hate your enemies. If you don't forgive them, God won't forgive you. He begins to preach a gospel so different, but he talks about how you treat others, you will be treated. He talks about loving others better than yourself. Matter of fact, if you think Jesus was an evil beast, let me just say to you, when he said these words, a new commandment I give to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and body, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. If that's 
talking about a threatening religious leader, then somebody mistook what Jesus was all about. And that's the amazing thing because that is who Jesus is, always has been. I'll say it again to anybody here that doesn't know Jesus. He loves you in spite of your sin. He wants you saved. He wants you to go to heaven. The word of God tells us God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He will bend over backwards to get you, but you still have to make the choice to receive him into your life as Lord and Savior. So let's talk about this for a minute. The Bible says that the Jews expected the Messiah to come as a conqueror, and Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, and that his death was not going to free the people from Rome, but it was going to forgive all people of their sins. He was the perfect sacrifice, and I'll tell you why that is. If you don't know, he was God's only son, born of a virgin, and the Bible says the entirety of his life, he never once sinned. You're going to have to somehow process that. And yet it also says he was by all means human, just like every one of us in this building. Imagine telling you, go home this week and don't sin. Some of you going, fat chance, pastor. Well, it can be that way. It doesn't have to be wrong and it doesn't have to be that destruction. The Bible says sin brings condemnation to everyone, but Christ, one act of righteousness, brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Now think about how powerful this is. This risen son of God, not killing, not maiming, not raising up armies to overthrow governments, but by preaching the gospel of God's forgiveness and love towards one another, he so threatens the religious establishment of his day that something profound happens because all of a sudden, evil religious people, a dominating Roman government, and a great multitude of people who were just sinners they found fault with Jesus through various lies being told about him. And when Pontius Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man, the people began to call out and say, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. These are people just like you and I. I might have been this way before I got saved many years ago. I might have been exactly like this because when you're not right with God, you don't look at Jesus. You maybe look at Jesus as the church you grew up in or the religion you were a part of that you walked away from. I know all of those stories. You may look at Jesus as just some boring thing, but I want to tell you when Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, you don't even know what living is even after the biggest party you've ever been to until you know Jesus Christ and you get up in the morning not worrying about what you did last night or who you get up in the morning and know that you know what I can smile I'm still right with God and on top of that I'm forgiven that same hatred that drew those people to call for his crucifixion over 2,000 years ago still lives today in the hearts of unsaved men and women. We're seeing this more and more, whether it be in the political realm, in the Hollywood realm, we're seeing it more and more that anything moral, anything unrighteous, or anything that is ungodly, we're excluding, I mean, we're exuding confidence in and then starting to put down anyone who wants to call for anything moral and righteous and good. Think with me for a moment. How can evil men cry for the absolute wicked, torturous murder of being nailed on a cross and hanging there till you can't breathe any longer because your body can no longer hold up the weight. How could people cry for that, beg for that, crucify him, crucify him when they had a choice between Jesus, the son of God, or Barabbas, a sinner, they chose Jesus because of what he represented and the conflict that they faced in all of their lives. Think with me. These are people that would have seen and or heard about all the miracles he did. Blind eyes open, dead raised, lepers healed. They would have seen and heard all of this, and yet those same people cry for Jesus' crucifixion. And I want to say it like this. <clears throat> John chapter 14, verse 6 
Jesus told his followers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Here's the truth. They tried to kill the truth. They tried to kill the Son of God because he conflicted with their religion and their religious beliefs. And we find this still today. We often go out, we tell people about Jesus Christ, and we tell them, he died for you, he loves you. And the first thing people say, well, I'm a Catholic, well, I'm a Mormon, well, I'm a Baptist, well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, well, I'm this, well, I... That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking religion. We're talking about Jesus. I know, but, 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 but. And so now Jesus comes along and he's conflicting with the religious order of the day and they tried to kill the truth to protect their religion. Secondly, I want to talk to you about not being able to ever cover up a resurrection. That's why today is so profound. And if you don't know the Bible story, again, I'm going to take you down a little bit of a road. And at the end of what I'm going to say, I'm sure you're going to be asking yourself, why in heaven's name would somebody want to do this? They tried to cover up the rising of Jesus Christ but you can't cover that up, and it didn't work. And I want you to think about this. Jesus comes off the cross. Joseph of Arimathea comes and says, can I have the body? Pontius, or not Pontius Pilate, but Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus at night, he was one of these religious people. He knew that he wasn't right with God. He comes to Jesus in John 3, verse 3, and says, Lord, we know that you're a teacher come from God, because we see the things you do. And then he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Any of you here wondering about heaven? That's what we're talking about, eternal life. If you're wondering how is it that I get to heaven, let me tell you, and I'll tell you who said it and why he was able to say it. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven, period. He didn't say there's lots of roads lead to Rome. He didn't say there's lots of religions. He already said it in John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And unless one is born again, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so if you're like me, even as a young man, I knew there was one place I didn't want to go, and I knew there was a place I really did want to go. I just didn't know how to get there. So here's the interesting thing. Jesus dies. They take his body off the cross. And... Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus lay him in a tomb. Amazing, because all of a sudden, here's what happens next. Ready? Matthew 27, verse 62. Hear what it says. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees, the relig <clears throat> religious rulers, gathered together with Pontius Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Not enough, they killed him. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Here they are. They're like atheists today. I don't believe in God. And they spend all their time trying to convince you they don't believe in a God they absolutely believe in because they're spending all of their lives trying to convince you they don't believe in one. That's exactly what they're doing. So... We know that the deceiver said, after three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal the body away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Boy, they're threatened by this guy. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure, sealing it with a large stone and setting a guard around it. You can read in this text how fearful they were that the things Jesus said were really true. You can read how fearful, these are the religious people, and now the Romans, how fearful they are that this might be true. If this guy comes out of the grave three days later, if he comes out and walks on the earth again, then it proves everything he said was right and that we're wrong. We can't let this happen. You can almost see the depth of their fear. They've killed Jesus, but that's not enough. That's not enough. And the problem with all of that is very simple. If he does resurrect, 
It proves that he was right and they are all wrong and we can't have him messing up our religion. Can anybody say amen? amen? We can't have him messing up our religion. Stay with me because some of you already know where I'm going. One writer said one thing about Christ that is so amazing is that he only goes where he's invited. Now hang on to that because if you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you have to invite him inside of your life. But they go a little farther. He appeared as a resurrected being after he rose only to those who knew his voice and those who were his disciples. And then this writer says, if it would have been me, I would have headed to the high priest house, Caiaphas, and I would have walked in and showed him that he made a huge mistake in having me crucified. And now Jesus has returned in his ultimate power and glory. He said, if I would have been that man, I would have gone back and said, see, I told you. But that's not what Jesus did. He didn't even bother going back and showing himself to Caiaphas. There were Pharisees who did accept Christ. There were Pharisees who got right with God. There were Pharisees who knew Jesus was real, starting with this man, Nicodemus. And he would appear to them, but to no others did he show himself alive because he didn't have to prove anything. The apostles and the followers of Jesus, they'd been tried. Their faith was increased. Some of the Roman soldiers and some of the Pharisees knew at the truth that happened that Jesus had risen. But now watch what happens because they attempted to completely cover up the resurrection. This is why we're here to celebrate. And listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 28, verse 11. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. When they were assembled together with the elders and consulted together, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will cover for you. We will appease him. So they took the money and they did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews even until this day. What are we talking about? They put Jesus in a tomb. They roll over the stone. They seal it up. They set a guard. Oh, but I love what happened next. I love what happened next. The Bible says in Matthew 27, listen, it says, and an angel went down from heaven to roll the stone that sealed the tomb and told because he was alive and he had risen. Look at what else it says. Some of the soldiers guarding the tomb, they saw the angel and responded by fainting. Ah, you ever see an angel? I promise you, you're going to faint too. Because he's not this little fluttery thing. Usually they're about nine feet tall with a fl flaming sword. Amen. You don't ever want to see an angel. Amen. But ponder the next. They saw this and they fainted. And so the Bible says, listen very carefully, amazing. Something spectacular has happened. But for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. And the women who were Jesus' followers, the angels told them, go announce the resurrection of Christ. And Matthew 28, verse 11, while Mary Magdalene and the others were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest, and they gave them large money to propagate a lie that Jesus didn't rise, but that his disciples came at night and stole the body away. Notice who they're talking to again, the religious people, the chief priest and the elders because Jesus kept messing up their religious order and it kept putting them under pressure. Why were they so mad at Jesus? Why would any religion be mad at Jesus? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why would people get mad when you speak to them about the gospel of Jesus and you must be born again and there is no other way to make heaven your home? because it contradicts everything they've been teaching people and it contradicts the lies that people like myself believed for a long time in the church I grew up in. I believed I couldn't get to God. 
I believed I couldn't read the Bible and understand it. I believed I couldn't know Jesus. I had to go through somebody else or through a statue or through a prayer. I believed that I could not know him and that he could not possibly love me. And to find that out was one of the greatest blessings in all of my life, to know that Jesus loves me. And the Bible says the soldiers took the money and did as they were directed. And this story's been spread among the Jews to this day. The guards, guards have regained consciousness. They quickly reported this to the chief priest and noticed something. They paid money to propagate a lie. I want you just to hang on to that for a minute. Because if you've ever been told the things of God aren't true, the things of God aren't true, that that's not right, you don't have to be born again, there's many ways to get to heaven. Well, let me ask you a question. How many born again people do you know? How many religious people do you know? And in that realm, are the religious people no different than the sinners? That was the church I grew up in. We went to church on Sunday, and then we sinned all the rest of the week until we could go back and talk to the guy in the little room and take communion back on Sunday morning, and then we're good till next week. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the church I grew up in. And I knew that, and I knew something was wrong with that, and I knew something was missing in my heart. And I'll tell you the words I said, and many of our folks know that. When I saw the hypocrisy, I said, if that's Christianity, I'm going to go be a sinner. And so here's the interesting thing for all of you today. Listen, I walked away, vowed to never go back in church again. And where did God meet me? In church, absolutely not. On the side of a mountain, about four hours from here in Globe, Arizona, when I was working in a copper mine, and a man sat down next to me and said, I want to tell you about Jesus. Joel, you're a sinner. He loves you, and he wants to forgive your sins not in a church, by an ordinary man like any of us sitting here that knew Jesus and he pushed and he prodded and he made me really angry because it's never good to tell a sinner they're a sinner because they don't like you when they do that. But then all of a sudden something amazing happened and it's going to happen to some of you this morning. All of a sudden God stepped in. And if you say, I don't believe you can hear the voice of God, well, just listen. All of a sudden, this sinner heard God say as clearly as I'm talking to you, Joe, you really are a sinner, but I love you, and if you'll let me, I'll not only forgive your sins, but I'll give you a new way forward. I'll give you a new way forward. I didn't believe that. I didn't believe that, but I knew there was something. I wasn't down and out, broken down, drug addict, psycho. I was just a very good sinner, and at that moment, Something happened. I couldn't wait to get to church and bowed my knee and gave my life to Jesus Christ. Not for a religion, not for the potter's house, not for the Baptist, the assemblies, but because Jesus Christ came into my life and changed me and he will do that for you. Listen very carefully and I'll draw this to a close. Jesus comes along and he begins to appear to all of his men and to people that knew him, and very profoundly, very profoundly, he begins to confront the truth that he is risen. You see, what bothered the Pharisees, the religious people so much, is the people that knew Jesus and saw him and had them help him, had him help them. They loved him. They worshiped him. And they commanded that the people not worship him and honor him and right in front of Jesus, they said, this man is a happy. We're not lording over anybody. You guys can do that if you want. But my father said, I'm here to show them the love of God, who God is in human flesh. And I'm here to give them a new way forward, not to lord over them and command and destroy them when they don't do right. And they were envious of Jesus because the people followed him. The Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're not gaining anything. Look, the world has gone after him. And even Pontius Pilate, think about this, said these words. He perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest 
and the religious people delivered him up to be crucified. They wanted their recognition. They wanted their prominence among the people. But Jesus became a thorn in their side because he showed the people who God really was and exposed the hypocrisy of their religion. They wanted praise and glory, and they wanted the worship and admiration of the people. They wanted the followers of Jesus. They wanted people to ignore Christ and follow them. But even the soldiers begin to turn and begin to realize. You might remember the one day as they crucified Jesus, a Roman soldier looks up and he goes, surely this man was the son of God. Every one of us needs to know that this morning. Surely this man whose death and resurrection we're celebrating this morning is the son of God and he wants to be real in you. You say, so how do you know it all happened, Pastor? Well, there's enough history to talk about. But here's the real evidence, and I'll give you six different things, and we'll pray. Six different things that prove the resurrection happened. Number one, an empty tomb. They went back. Angels were sitting there. He is not here. He is risen. Luke says, on the first day of the week, very, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus because the angel said, he's risen, he is not here. He then appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other women. Even the apostles didn't believe Mary when she said, I talked to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, he begins to meet with the disciples, one walking on the road, others in the house where they were. He just kind of walked in. And you say, what does that mean? How does that prove the resurrection? Well, the house they were in, they were locked behind closed doors. They were locked behind and they were scared to death because when they crucified Jesus, they made it known, we're coming for you as well. And they're hiding and they're afraid. And all of a sudden, something incredible happened. Those same men come out of the rooms. They come out, they open the doors. Next thing you know, they're out on the street and they're preaching Jesus to the very people that just crucified Jesus. And you can read it for yourself. In one meeting, 3,000 people repented and got right with God. Another thousands more came to Christ. So you have an empty tomb. You have Mary uh, having the angel appear. You see all of a sudden the disciples have come out of the closed room because to go from being radically afraid and hiding to come out boldly and not afraid what happens to them, something profound must have happened in their life. Can anybody say amen? amen. And the Bible says that Jesus appeared to over 500 men and women after he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the 12, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters of the same time, most of whom are still living while some have died. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, says his brother. And then Paul, the greatest hater of all of Christian time, killer of Christians, Going out to kill more, Jesus meets him on the Damascus Road. He knocks him off of his horse. Paul's blinded by this incredible light. Sounds like a Hollywood movie, doesn't it? But it's going to happen to some people here. Listen. Paul's going his own way. He hates Christians. He hates Christianity. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. God knocks him off his horse. And as he's sitting there on the ground, there's a bright light shone around him. And what's his words? Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? He knew. Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? And he tells him, I have many things for you. Go into the city. There's a man there. He's going to pray for you. And you're going to all of a sudden know, while you've been this horrible religious killer of Christians, <laughs> all of your life you're going to know that I am risen. Paul already knew that. Paul already saw that. And he went in, and the man prayed for him, and the blindness left his eyes, and he could see, and Paul became one of the greatest preachers of Jesus Christ there ever was. And here's the last portion, and I want you to think about this. If I ask everybody here this question, is there anyone that you know that you would be willing to die for? And most husbands would say, absolutely, my wife and kids. I agree with you. I would do the same thing. Most wives would say, I would die for my kids, maybe not my husband. Well, we hope they would. Anyway, that's another sermon. 
Most wives would kill for their children. You might even kill for your mom and dad. You might even die for, I mean, for your mom and dad. You might die for someone close to you. But imagine, imagine looking at the group of people that we have sitting here today. Imagine dying for people that didn't like you, didn't care for you, didn't love you, didn't want you. Imagine that. The apostles would give their lives for Jesus. They must have seen something. Matthew, the tax collector who wrote the book of Matthew, he died as a martyr in Ethiopia, killed with a sword. John was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil during a wave of persecution in Rome. He was miraculously delivered from death and then sentenced to the mines on that prison island called Patmos. James, the brother of Jesus, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was thrown from the southeast pinnacle of the temple over a hundred feet down when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. And when they discovered he survived the fall, his enemies beat him to death with a club. Bartholomew, known as Nathaniel, in whom there is no guile, was a missionary in Asia. He witnessed all across Turkey and those Muslim nations today, and he was killed for his preaching and Arminia being whipped to death by a cat of nine tails. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross after being whipped by seven soldiers. It doesn't take seven soldiers. They tied his body to the cross, which was only going to prolong his agony, and his followers reported that when he was led toward the cross, Andrew saluted it in these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it, and he preached to his tormentors until he died. Thomas, I was just in India. You can't miss in this place called Chennai, St. Thomas Hill. Thomas went into India, and he preached the gospel, and there was a revival, and yet people hated him. And he was stabbed with a spear, and they still have that place right outside the airport in Chennai, St. Thomas Hill. You can look it up for yourself. Matthias, who was the disciple that replaced Judas Iscariot, he was stoned and then beheaded. And even the apostle Paul, he was tortured and then beheaded by Nero. And all of them gave their lives for the cause of Christ because when they knew him, when they saw him, you can tell any story you want, but when you've been touched by Jesus, when you watched what he's done, when you saw that he rose from the grave, I want to say it this morning, you cannot cover up the resurrection and you cannot hide the cross and you certainly can't eliminate Jesus Christ from men and women who want to know him. You can't even pretend it didn't happen because the world has profoundly been changed. And if you dare to look at your calendar, all you have to know is that our calendar today is based on the life and the death of Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. No one looking around for just another moment if you'd stay with us today. We appreciate you being with us this morning. We're grateful for you. On this Easter Sunday morning, so thank God for what this day means to everyone here. I cannot move on in our service without first giving every one of us an opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and to personally know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If I came in here this morning, if I came in here this morning and I said I'd like to offer you the Potter's House Church religion. I would not blame you if you got up and walked out and never came back. But I'm not offering you the Potter's House Church religion. If I came in here this morning and said you need to join our church, I would not blame you if you got up and walked out because I wouldn't have done the exact same thing When that man began to talk to me about Jesus, if he was offering me a church, he was offering me religion, I would have showed him one finger on my hand and got up and walked away. But he didn't. He said, Joe, you can be forgiven of your sins because you're a sinner. And God said the same thing. And my wife and I came to Christ and gave our lives to Jesus. And we've never been the same. In this building this morning, perhaps are men and women, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
You might know him as an image in the front of a church dead on a cross. Might know him as an image hanging around someone's neck or your neck. But you don't know him personally. And I'm not trying to be offensive, but he's alive. He's real. And he wants to come into your life. Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and fellowship with him and he with me. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I wonder if perhaps you're here today. It's Resurrection Sunday, Easter. But beyond all of that, perhaps you're sitting in this building and you know you're not right with God. There's sin in your life. There's times you look in the mirror and you don't even like looking at yourself because you know what's going on in your life. Doesn't mean you have to be down and out, gutter drunk, drug addict that can't quit. It just simply means I'm a sinner. With my sin, I'm hurting people. I've hurt other people. I'm hurting myself. And I don't know how to quit because I've wanted to. Today, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, can I ask you? You're here today if Jesus came knocking on your door, and he is right now. How many here would say, Pastor, as you close this service, would you remember me in prayer? I'm not right with God. I'm not saved. I'm don't even know what it is to be forgiven. But I've done some things and I know I need God's mercy. Would you pray for me before we close with no one looking around? If that's you today, would you lift up a hand and just simply say, Pastor, I want your prayer. I want to get right with God. Remember me in prayer as you close the service. Lift your hand. Lift your hand very quickly right now. Pray for me this morning. I need God to touch my life. This is not an invitation to join our church. I need to get right with God. Who else? Who else? Who else? Honest hearts. Who else? I want to get right with God. I want to know Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. Who else? Be honest. Join these that have been honest with God. I want to get right with God. Lift your hand. Pray for me this morning. Maybe you've known the Lord at one time, but somehow you find yourself a long way away from him. Maybe it's so far back you don't even remember how you got so far away but you know you need to get back right. Take this moment right now to say, God, I need you to be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Would you lift your hand and join these that have been honest with God? Pray for me this morning. Pastor, I'm not saved. I'm backslidden. I'm away from God. Here's my hand. Anyone else? Lift your hand. Lift your hand. This is not the hardest thing you'll ever do. The hardest thing will be standing before God and God saying, I'm sorry, I never knew you. I never knew you. I gave you every opportunity, but you would not respond. Last call. Anyone else? I'm not saved. I'm backslidden. I need Jesus. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. And I want to speak to every Christian here. Why would they try so hard to destroy Jesus and did? And then even after they've killed him, try so hard to cover up the fact that he rose again. Because he said he would. And you know the answer to that. Because if he rose again, it proved every single thing he ever said was true. And that he was the son of God. And nobody else could ever take his place. And by virtue of that, nobody else could die for our sins except Jesus Christ. That contradicts a lot of religious philosophy. That contradicts a lot of secular worldly thinking. I've heard people over the years say, keep your Jesus out of my womb. Keep your Bible out of my bed or out of my lifestyle or whatever else you want to say. You can't take Jesus out. You can't leave him out. You can't take Jesus out. Simply put, he's going to be there always. And he will give every one of us opportunities to know him, to live for him, and to tell others about him. On this Resurrection Sunday, we're going to pause for a moment. Maybe there's men and women here, you know there's things that you need to make right with God. Nothing like a day like today to say, God, I know you, I want to know you, I've been away from you, I'm struggling. I'm going to take this opportunity to make some things 
right with God. I'm going to make some decisions about dealing with my personal sin or some of my attitudes. I'm going to deal with my anger, my resentment, my rejection. I'm going to deal with my guilt that I've carried for years. This altar is going to be a place of deliverance this morning. And the only one that can touch us is the one who rose from the grave. So if God's speaking to you, we're going to sing a chorus this morning. I'm going to invite you to come before we have communion. If you want to do business with God at this altar, just simply rededicate your life to Christ. No day like today to say, I'm going to start fresh. This year is going to be different. Let's all stand. The altars are open. We're going to sing a chorus this morning as we honor God. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there Sierra. is hope and there is freedom I, I speak, speak Jesus, Jesus. your name is power your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine Father, help us today, God. Every heart, every mind, my God. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. To every soul held, held captive by depression, by depression I speak Jesus. Jesus. Your name. And your name is Father, power. we ask your touch this morning. Your name is healing. Resurrection, glory, and dominion. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. As our hearts are bowed for a moment, would you bow your head for a moment today? There is no day like today on the calendar that we are controlled by every single day and every single year than this day. The day Jesus came out of the grave, he proved to every doubter. He proved to every unbeliever. He proved to every believer that he was real and the son of God. That could not be taken away. And he walked on the earth and 40 days later he ascended. He ascended into heaven. I can't even imagine a crowd of people standing and there goes Jesus. Jesus rising up into the air like a hot air balloon. And everybody's just watching as the Savior, risen from the dead, goes off up to heaven. And then the angels, those angels keep coming around. And they said, what are you looking up here for? What are you looking up here for? The same Jesus that you're watching is going to return again the same way you see him going. But don't forget what he told us all to do. And that's go into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature. On the side of a mountain in a copper mine, in the grocery store, in the break room, out on the street, on the street corner, in your own family, sitting at Easter dinner. Can I speak with you guys for a minute? Imagine if this gets loose. Imagine how much this would change people's lives. Dump the religious stuff dump the religious stuff and the rules and the regs 
When Jesus comes in, nobody has to tell you what you're doing wrong. Nobody has to tell you what you need to do right. You need to learn some things. But when Jesus come in, comes in and a man or a woman is born again, I want to tell you in a moment of time, you know exactly right and you know exactly wrong and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. From the moment you or I pray that prayer and say, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. There's things I need to stop doing and then God gives you the power to stop doing them. To stop doing them. We're going to ask everybody to return back to your seats. We're going to sing this song again. And as we do, we're going to prepare for our communion service. So why don't you just take a seat for a moment. We're going to sing this chorus again. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. We're going to honor God. And then we're going to share in a communion service. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Father, we so thank you right now. Over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark condition oh, starts God. to break. Thank God. Declaring there is hope, hope and there, there is freedom. I speak, speak Jesus. Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. We're going to ask everybody, they're going to sing quietly. We're going to sing this chorus. We're going to start right here on the front row. And I want to ask all of you as we're singing, come forward, grab a cup, grab a piece of bread, but hold on to it. Go back to your seat. And as you come out the side, Go back the other side. You on the side, just come on down and try not to bump into everybody. We don't need any head-on collisions. Amen. But starting at the front row as we sing this chorus, come grab a cup, grab a piece of bread. Parents, this probably shouldn't be for your small children because they really don't understand either the death of Christ or their need for forgiveness and salvation. So hold off till they understand what we're doing. But I invite all of you to join us. Let's stand, or you can stay right there, one row at a time. Start right over here. You guys come, grab a cup, just kind of go this way. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. I want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace. I speak oh, to you. Oh, God, you help us this morning. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus, oh, your name, 
Your name is power, and your name is healing, your name is love. And break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn light. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name, and your name is power. Your name is healing, your name. Break every stronghold, and break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn light. Oh, I just want to speak. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. Thank you. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. What a joy. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Amen. We're going to share in communion together. Just a quick understanding of what communion was. Jesus is meeting with his disciples for what's going to be their last meal together. And it's in the middle of that, several things happen. And and before we have communion just this year, think with me for a moment. What he did when he first went in, he went over and he pulled his garment up and he tied it around himself and he got a bucket of water and he went around and he began to wash all the disciples' feet. And you think about how profound that is. Here's the Savior, here's the Son of God, here is the discipler, they're calling him master, they're already calling him Lord, and he gets up and he kneels down and he begins to wash all the disciples' feet. There's something significant in that because, again, he's breaking that whole religious tradition thing. The Pharisees lorded over, Jesus said, I've come to serve. And so he kneels down and he starts to wash all the disciples' feet, and then he says, we're going to have a quick talk because this is probably going to be the last time that We're going to be able to do this together. And so just sitting there having a meal, he's already done the unthinkable by washing stinky feet, tells you something about Jesus. And then he comes and he says, here, I'm going to break this bread. And he starts handing it around. And they probably would have had one of those loaves and they might have each taken a piece off and held it there. And he begins to explain to them when we have this meal right now before you eat. I want to explain something to you. This bread that you hold in your hand, this is symbolic of my body. You don't know this yet. All that's going to transpire tonight after we leave this room, 
But this bread is symbolic of my body. And just like we're breaking off pieces for each of us here, this is my body that's broken for you. And he's speaking to the men who are going to carry the gospel forward. I'm speaking to our church. Churches aren't supposed to be divided, fragmented places where people just kind of come together and nobody gets along and there's no fellowship and there's no friendliness and we're not in this all for one and one for all. A church is supposed to be exactly that. That's what he was doing with the disciples. He had already said, this one of you is going to betray me and Judas has done what Judas was going to do. But he's calling the rest of them to understand, even though there's a betrayer in our midst, don't forget, we're all in this together, and I'm here for you, and you're here for me. When we take communion this morning, I want you to remember that about our church and believers in Jesus Christ. So I want you to take your bread, if you would. You can stand to your feet. This will be easier to swallow. I guess I'm the forgotten disciple up here. Praise the Lord. I better get a piece of bread. Glory to God. The Bible says something the Apostle Paul re recalls this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So imagine he's, he's getting ready to go. This is it. And he breaks off a piece of bread and they hand the little piece around and they all break off a piece. And he says, remember this, guys, this will be significant. Because after that, any time you take a loaf of bread and you break a piece off, you're going to remember that. He wasn't saying make an ordinance of communion every day or every service or all the time. He said as often as you do it, when you sit down, have you ever thought about this? That one of the reasons when we sit down to a meal and we pray and thank God for the food we're about to receive is because of this? As often as you do this, as often as you eat, as often as you break bread together, do this in remembrance of me. Let's bow our heads. Father, we're asking you in this time of communion this morning, God, that you touch every man and woman. God, that you link us together in one heart and one spirit, in one mind, in unity. For there you command blessing where there's unity in the people that serve you, Lord. And I ask you to bless every family every individual here, every home and every heart, God, that is standing in this place or watching online as we eat this bread, let us for always and even every meal when we bow our head to give thanks, remember all that you've done for us, starting with dying and then providing all through our lives from here to eternity. Bless this time we eat in Jesus' name, amen. You can eat your bread and it's okay if it touches your teeth. I don't know where that came from. Yes, I do. <laughs> and now I know why he gave the cup. Because you can't swallow. And then he took the cup. And remember, this is just a, a good old-fashioned meal with his disciples. Probably done this hundreds of times. But then Paul goes on to write. He says, in the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying... This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is just grape juice in your cup. Listen, it's, there's nothing significant. This is pita bread. This is grape juice. It is what it is. But in reality, as we're doing this this morning, we are remembering Jesus died, he gave his life, his body was broken as we saw in that film this morning in Sunday school, and he shed his blood so that you and I could be forgiven. I will tell everybody here who doesn't know this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so this had to happen, and every time you think about, Lord, I am forgiven, I am forgiven, you've touched me, you've saved me, I've done a lot of things, but I am forgiven, remember this, because that's what the blood does. Amen. You can drink your cup this morning. Father, we so thank you right now for our congregation. We thank you today for the blood and the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We are so thankful that you made a plan all the way back with Adam and Eve. As one man's sin came into the world and death through sin, so by one man's sacrifice, 
the world can be forgiven and be made righteous with you. And as we celebrate this time right now, Resurrection Sunday, let us never forget, without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no way to be right with you, Lord. But thank you for all you provided. Thank you for not only providing, but then proving to each of us that your son was who he said he was, the son of God, the risen Savior, and the resurrected Christ. Lord, make him real in us this year and in the years to come. Let us to know you and know Jesus better than we ever have before. And I'm asking you, bless this time together, every family and home, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this song again right now before we dismiss. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Worship God with us as we sing this in closing this morning. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Fear and all anxiety. Declaring their held captive by depression. depression. I speak Jesus, your name, and your name is power, and your name is, and your name is life, and break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the dark. Father, have your every hand. Every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, sing it with all your heart. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name, and your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is love. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a Let's give the Lord a clap offering of praise as we would honor God this morning. blood cleanse. Amen. If anyone here or watching online is dealing with cancer, I want you as we pray in closing, just put your hand on your body and I want you to ask God to bring that blood into your body right now. I don't know who that is, but I feel someone here or someone watching online right now is wrestling with cancer. Just put your hand on your body. We're going to pray as we close our service. Father, we are thankful Lord, for you said, by your stripes we are healed by the shedding of the blood. God, we ask you to touch every mind, every heart, every body. God, for these gathered here today, we pray supernatural grace, deliverance, and freedom. God, for those needing healing, we break every curse, sickness, and disease. We take down every stronghold and lie of Satan. We're believing you, my God, even for the year ahead. Bless and cover our families and homes, our church and all you're doing. And God, let us honor you on this Resurrection Sunday in Jesus' name. Let's give God praise one more time. Father, we thank you, Lord, even the presence. You are dismissed this morning. Don't forget our baptism tonight.
you've been saved, not yet been baptized in water, sign up sheet. You need to bring with you a change of clothes and a towel. We baptize. We don't just sprinkle. And so if you want to do that tonight, get your name on the list and we'll do that in our evening service. 630 tonight, 530 prayer. God bless you. Have a great Easter Sunday lunch.